Good morning, Greenhouse. We are so um, glad that you are joining us again for another week of virtual worship. This week, we just want to extend a huge thank you to Camp Livingstones in Etowah, who is allowing us to um, come and film this week's service in their chapel. They um, are an incredible youth ministry um, here in the McMinn County. Um, they reach to so many youth across the nation. Um, every summer, people come in um, and get poured into. They get to participate in all their outdoor activities, um, but most of all, um, they get the Word of God poured into their life, and they are transformed, and so um, if you've never been to camp, come, and they would love to have you here, um, and just to see what they do here, and support what they are doing here, and pouring into the lives of the next generation. This week, I was reading in Psalm 19, verse 7, and it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And I love the part in the verse where it says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Because right now, I think in our world, we're hearing so many stories, so many things um, in the news that we don't really know what to believe, but the Word of God says that the testimony of the Lord is sure. We, it is trustworthy. It never changes. He is constant. He um, and just because the world is changing and it is chaotic doesn't mean that he is changing or his character is changing. And so sometimes I think that in the culture we live in, we can become so accustomed to having access to his law and to the testimony of what he has done. Um, and we can become so um, almost numb to his word. Um, but I encourage you to begin to look at his word during this time, to look at his testimony, because like I just read, it says that his testimony is sure and it never changes. Um, so I encourage you to dive into the Word for yourself um, during this time when you're at home and have quite a, quite a lot of free time. So I'm going to pray for us before we go into a time of worship. Father, I thank you for your Word. Father, I thank you that, like Psalm 19 says, that it, your Word, um, your testimony is sure. Jesus, your Word is trustworthy. Jesus, your Word is truth. And so, Father, I thank you that, Jesus, your word is alive and it's active and it never changes, Father. I pray over every person that's watching this morning, God, and I just pray that they would just feel your presence right now. God, no matter if they're driving in their car or if they're in their living room, Father, I just pray that they would sense your presence like never before. God, I pray for a hunger for your word, that, Jesus, we would no longer just become numb to your word because we have such free access to it, but, Jesus, we would know that, Jesus... It's only because of your word. It's only because of the hope that's in your word that, Jesus, we are alive and that we have access to freedom today. And so, Father, I pray, um, God, that you would guide the service and, Father, that you would move in everybody's heart that's watching. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Good morning, Greenhouse. We're so glad that you are joining us virtually here on Facebook Live. We hope that you have had a great week. This morning we're going to sing about the promises of the Lord. This song really proclaims the scriptures of Jeremiah 29, 11, talks about God having a plan for us, a hope and a future. And I also think of Romans 8, 28, where it talks about um, in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So we hope that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you will join us in worship this morning.
Hey, good morning, Greenhouse. Uh, really glad that you tuned in today so we, we could worship uh, together. Uh, let me pray for us. God, thank you so much that we have the ability to connect with each other over these digital means. This is not normal for your church because you call us an assembly of people together. So we do look forward, Jesus, when you bring us back together. And I pray that that day would be soon and you would make provision for that. And it would be a day of rejoicing, God, and you would all keep us safe until that time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, one of the things I want to say to us today is happy birthday. Two years ago, April 15th, we had our first church gathering, and it was really exciting. Sunday morning, everybody excited. And, and you know what? I'm just as excited two years later because I'm seeing all that God is doing in the greenhouse. And it's uh, happy birthday or happy anniversary. They're kind of like intertwined, I guess, when you think about, you know, a church or a business starting or not that we're a business, but you know, when you think about something starting up, it's like birthday and anniversary. We're both in uh, one. Um, one of the things, one of the phrases that I've been thinking about lately is uh, that we are birthed to serve, that we are birthed to serve. And that's one of the reasons that God actually, you know, gave birth to the greenhouse or, or that planted us because we are, we're called to be servants, just like we looked at a while back in James chapter one. Uh, Paul, who wrote 13 letters in the New Testament, and hopefully you're familiar with, with Paul's writings, he says this, you know, in Galatians twice, he says, uh, basically describing the Christian faith that our Christian faith is faith working through love or faith working through love and through love serve one another. We are called to serve one another in love. And I think that's uh, this, the sign, the symbol, the hallmark of an authentic Christian life is serving others. And, and, and people crave a real servant. And they know, they can see the difference between someone who's manipulating them for their own means or somebody who's just after them. But when people see the authentic serving of Christ through you, it's awesome. Now, I remember in sixth grade, okay, bear with me just a moment, I'll tell you a little story. I remember in sixth grade, um, I, we had this uh, sort of educational plan where you would take a baby home and you would have to care for it and bring it back. And so uh, at that time, we had sacks of flour. <laughs> and sacks of flour were, were the, was the baby I was supposed to take home and care for and write in a journal and a diary all that I did for that baby. And then I would bring the baby back to school the next day with my journal and I would say all that I did. You know, the teachers got smart and now they have these babies that have keys in them. So if the baby cries, you have to get up in the middle of the night and cry. Because what I did with my sack of flour is I just threw it on the couch when I got home because, you know, it's not real. You know, there, there's something fake about it. It's, it's uh, and people I think crave what is real. Matter of fact, that year I, uh, I drew every person had to draw something distinct about the babies that they had, and so I drew twins. So I had two sacks of flour, and I would take my two sacks of flour and throw them on my couch when I got home. Now, I don't do that with my real kids, right? Obviously, because they're real, you know? When things are real, we treat them differently, and people crave what is real. And that's what James is getting at in James chapter 1. What is real? What is an authentic expression of our Christian faith? What is the outgrowing expression of our relationship with Jesus? Now, he uses the word religion, and sometimes we think of the word religion as bad. We hear phrases like, okay, I have a relationship, not a religion. And I get that, and I agree with that, because we, we are going to the why behind the what. You know, we're going to the fact that we have a relationship with Jesus, and outgrowing from that is, is the expression of our faith. But what James is getting at here is not so much that um, relationship aspect, but what comes out of that? And what is the authentic expression of our Christian faith? What is the outgrowing expression of our relationship with Jesus? And he's going to get to it at the end of the chapter. Now, don't, don't beat me there, okay? Wait till we get there. Now, we're going to start in verse uh, 19. And by the way, we're picking up right where we left off in the book of James because we started this a month ago. Matter of fact, our last message before Corona hit was 
count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. And so James really helped us. God, his Holy Spirit, through the word, really helped us frame what we're experiencing right now. If you remember from that time, we talked about if you're in a trial, don't give up. And if you're in a temptation, don't give in. And James gives us that wisdom and the power to live that out through Jesus. So let's look at James chapter 1, uh, verse 19. And I happen to think this is a very, very relevant uh, book for what we're facing because James is actually writing to people in the diaspora, which basically means the people of God scattered abroad. You know, so it, it kind of fits where we're at right now. And some of the things that James is going to speak to them is also going to speak to us. So he's, he's, and what he's driving toward, I believe, is this authentic expression of Christian faith. What is the authentic expression of our Christian faith? We know that we're rooted in Jesus. What else are we rooted in? What, we know that we're rooted in Jesus. What are we bearing fruit to? And James is going to get to that. But before James gets to that, in verse 19 through 27, James is going to tell us three attitude that we have to overcome. Three attitudes that we have to overcome. I call these attitude hurdles. Attitude hurdles. He's going to give us three of them that we have to overcome in order to pursue the authentic expression of our Christian faith. And I'm so glad, by the way, that we have the Bible. Can I just take a second and say this? That we have God's Word to help us understand what is the proper expression of our Christian faith. You know, you can think of things like Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? But you would do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Or, or I bet James even thought of, of, of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verse 12, and it says the same thing as Micah 6, 8. These are, these are passages from the Old Testament. It says, and now Israel, what does the Lord require of you? But fear the Lord your God. Walk in his ways and love him and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. And I believe that James had those things in mind when he is talking to us about what is the authentic expression of the Christian faith. And we cannot find, folks, we cannot find what is the proper, real, authentic expression of our Christian faith apart from the Word. We have to be in the Word. Now, let me make a huge side note here, okay? So stay with me. I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place. Um, but uh, 2020, I believe, and our elders believe, that 2020, we have, a, we have a huge focus of making disciples. And what that means is, a big part of that is, is diving into God's word and understanding it for yourself. And Corona is actually helping us because we're not gathering together right now. So we individually are hoping, I'm hoping individually, we are spending time with God in his word. Now you might be using Right Now Media, you might be using version, you might be you know, listening to podcasts, but it is very important for us to get alone, to get aside, spend time with God in his word in order for us to find out what is the authentic expression of our Christian faith. People are looking for that and we treat it, diff we treat it differently. So let's jump right in. What are these three relationship hurdles that we have to get rid of in order for us to pursue authentic expression of our Christian faith? What are these three what are these three attitude hurdles, excuse me, three attitude hurdles that we have to get rid of in order to pursue um, an authentic expression of our Christian faith? Well, the first one is this, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let's say that again. Know this, my beloved brothers. Now you can read it along with me. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, aside from where I think James is moving in here and what the Holy Spirit is inspiring in the Word, I, I also think that's just ge good general wisdom, right? <laughs> Especially in our uh, corona time where, you know, we just got news that kids aren't going back to school and life looks a diff little different. Some of you are more isolated than normal. Some of you are working more than normal and, and things are, there's just not this normalcy that we're used to in the structure and routine and probably that affects the way you see yourself and, and the achievements that we that we hope for and even the connectivity and relationship it's just all out of whack and so and and put all that together in the same recipe <laughs> you get frustration and irritation and, and it's hard and James is sitting here and he knows that he's writing to people who are scattered abroad people who are needing to find joy in their trials and he says this in verse 19 be quick to hear Slow to speak, slow to anger. It's just good wisdom, good wisdom. And I feel like I could live by that wisdom for the rest of my life. And verse 20 tells us why. He says, because the anger of man, your anger and my anger, does not produce the righteous desire 
of God or does not produce the righteousness of God. Basically, he's saying that when you get mad, yes, you want the last word, right? You want to be heard. You want everybody to know your point. But what he's saying here is the right, our anger does not produce God's righteousness. Now, I know you're probably thinking, okay, well, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Jesus got angry because children uh, were coming to him and the disciples were saying no. And, and there was a time that he overturned money changing tables in the temple. And yes, Jesus did that because Jesus is Jesus. All right. He has pure righteous anger. But most of the time, 99% of the time, our anger is not producing the righteousness of God. Our anger, matter of fact, James says it here, it's not producing God's righteous outcome. I know you want to be heard. I know you want to point the finger. I know you want to call a foul. Men, I know you want to be right. Women, I know you want to be understood, right? We all want those things. But our anger, our human anger, is not producing God's righteousness. But there's a reason that he says this. The reason that what James is getting at here is that it's not just a, a casual, normal, everyday anger. Here's the anger that he's going for. It's the anger that we feel, the hostility that we feel when we are corrected by God's word, when we're corrected by someone. So the first attitude hurdle that we have to overcome is hostility. Hostility, because if you keep reading, he says, with meekness, with meekness, receive the implanted word. That basically means, hey, take the punching gloves off. Take the boxing gloves off. When God is correcting us or he sends someone into our life to correct us, when your spouse is correcting you, <laughs> right? Okay, that might have happened today. All right, I'm just saying. Um, thank, thankfully, I had this verse in my mind and I was, I was uh, humble and, and, and meek, uh, not normally. But it says, with meekness, receive the implanted word, the word that God has already put in your heart. Receive it, live it out. He's saying some of you have this attitude of hostility that when you're corrected and, and when God confronts you with sin or, or a, a bad habit or a way of thinking or a way of believing that's wrong, we get hostile. We're, we're saying, I'm not going to do that. Well, I know what God said, but I know what I'm going to do anyway. God says, no, you can't have an authentic expression of your Christian faith if you're going to be hostile to the word. Receive with meekness the implanted word. And he goes on to say, here's the incentive which is able to save your souls. And I don't believe he's talking about just the day you got saved. I think he's talking about the ongoing process that God's word does in our heart. That when we keep receiving God's word, it keeps purifying us, it keeps saving us. See, the Bible says you are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. You were saved when you put your faith in Christ, he forgave you of your sins and you have a promised home in heaven, but he's also saving you, I-N-G, saving you. It's an ongoing process. He is rescuing you from the presence of sin in your life until one day we stand with him forever rid of all sin. So the implanted word is receiving us. And it says right here in, in James that the one thing that is probably creating hostility in our life is the known ways of disobedience. It's the things we know about. It's the things we know that God's word says not to do, but we're doing it anyway. He says right here, get rid of all filth and rampant wickedness in verse 21. If you want to receive the word of God, you have to get rid of those things in order to receive it. I think of it like this. If you YouTube this, this is actually kind of cool. If you YouTube how to catch a baboon, it's very interesting. So in Africa, they have these huge anthills, okay, or these huge mounds, dirt's mounds. And what, what uh, some people do is they, they carve out uh, holes in these dirt mounds and they, they create just a big enough hole for a baboon to put his or her hand in the hole. And then, then at the end of the hole, there's this place where they put seeds, okay? And so the baboon or, or a monkey in some places will put their hand through the hole, reach and grab the seeds or grab the food and they won't let it go. They will not let it go and that's how captors capture baboons or monkeys because they will not, the, the captor literally will walk up and grab the monkey or the baboon because they won't let it go. And God is saying, if you want to be saved, if you want to be continually purified by the word of God, there are some things you've got to give up. You've got to give those things up for your own good. Looking back to Deuteronomy 10, 12, for your own good. So the first attitude we have to overcome is hostility. And God tells us the antidote to that. It's humility. So we have to move from hostility to humility to receive God's word. Well, he gives us the second one. 
Okay, and I almost think that these increase in uh, danger or caution or, or intensity. So the second one is this, it's in verse 22. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So you look in verse 19, it says, know this. He's saying, you need to know this. Verse 22 is saying, there's something that's deceiving you. You're being duped. Okay, if you're just listening to the Bible and not doing what it says, you're being duped. Okay, if you're a supervisor out there, you've had people that work for you or work under you or work with you and, and, and you tell them what to do and they don't do it, you know and you see the frustration of, of this. You're like, Did, didn't you hear what I said? Or if you're a parent and you're thinking, okay, uh, kids, are you hearing me? Like, yeah, we heard you. Well, obviously you're not hearing me. Are you hearing me? Do you know what I'm saying? So God is saying, don't be deceived. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. And I think what he's getting at here is the second attitude adjustment that we need. Ooh, that kind of sounds bad, attitude adjustment. But it's what we need. Attitude adjustment is apathy. Apathy. We hear the word, but don't put it into practice. Like, you know, we, 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 we're here at church on Sunday, or maybe our parents make us come. Maybe your parents made you watch this video, and you're like, hey, when is this going to be over so I can go do something else? Um, you know, but don't be just a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. What is the, and we're going to get to the activity, the authentic expression of our Christian faith here in just a minute. But be a doer of the word and not just a hearer because if you just hear, you deceive yourself. Now, I'm always humored and amused by people that like to go to church. Now, forgive me if this offends some of you, that people that like to go to church and they like to leave feeling beat up. Like, man, that was a great message and he really brought it hard but there's no change in their life. Have you noticed that people are like that? They're like, man, you know, they preached a firm sermon and a good word, made me feel real guilty about myself, but there's no change. <laughs> That's not the design of God's word. The design of God's word is to convict us so that we're changed. So not just so that we hear it, but so we do it. And he goes on to say this. If you're like that person, if you're a person who just like kind of hears the word but doesn't do what it says, he says this. He says, you're like somebody who looks in the mirror and forgets what you look at like when you walk away. Now, I know some of you spend way too much time in the mirror, right? How many of you would leave for work or leave your home with a little bit, you, you know, your lipstick is a little bit too far down, you know, your mascara is all over the place, or guys, you know, I know we've got some uh, trendy, um, trendy guys that, that kind of have that part here, you got the hard part and the, and, the, and the hair wax going. And, you know, if you saw a hair out of place, you wouldn't be, leaving your house or you're looking at that full length mirror and your dress is wrinkled or guys your your pants aren't rolled up exactly right <laughs> or or there's just some flaw or blemish when you look in the mirror you know you would fix it you would remedy that you you would take uh, pains to, to do whatever necessary in order for for you to uh, look better um, based on what you see in the mirror well James is saying when we hear the word of God and we don't do anything about it it's like we're looking in the mirror we walk away we just forget what we look at like. But notice how he, listen to this, notice how in verse 25, he describes God's word. He describes God's word. He's changing our minds about how we should look at the Bible. So I think one of the reasons that people are apathetic about doing God's word is because they think their plans are better than God's plans. That's what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. Obviously, God's holding out. He's not good. Something's wrong. I need to do what I want to do. No, God, look at what it says about God's word right here in verse 25. It says this. He calls it the perfect law. There's no blemish. There's nothing wrong. It's a perfect law. And notice this. It's, it is the law of, fill in the blank if you're reading, the law of liberty. It's not the law of constraint. So many times we look at God's word and, and we think, oh, that's just so constraining. That's, you know, that, that's, that's a party pooper, you know, that's a downer. And no, it's a law that brings freedom. It's the word that brings freedom. I think too many of us think when we look at the Bible, we think, well, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, with whomever I want, wherever I want. And that's not liberty. Folks, that is not liberty. That is bondage. You know, when you're driving down the road, there's a reason why you, you practice limitations by driving between this line and the dotted line, right? <laughs> because when you limit your freedoms, you actually have more freedom. When you cross the line, it's disaster. It lessens your freedom. Think about professional athletes, the, their nutritional 
the way they, they, they eat, the way they work out. They are limiting their freedoms so that they can be more free in a certain area in their life. Or musicians or anybody who's skillful at something. We limit our freedoms so we can be more free. And God is saying, I want you to be free. I think we're apathetic because we think God is constraining us. We hear the word, but we don't do it because God's just constraining and he's not good and it's a joy killer. No, folks, nothing could be further from the truth. God is a joy giver. He commands these things for our good. Wow, when we have a relationship with Jesus and the things that Jesus produces in our lives bring joy to us. And even if they kind of go toward the spectrum of, you know, dutiful obedience, at some point, God revives joy in our heart. Revives joy in our heart to obey and follow what he says. Now notice this, that God gives an incentive to every attitude adjustment. Okay, first attitude was hostility. We need humility. The incentive is he's gonna purify your life. He's gonna save your soul. He's gonna make you more mature in Christ. The second thing is this. He says, don't be apathetic. Remove the apathy and, and replace it with activity. What God says, do. I think every time we read the word, we should be asking ourselves, what is the one thing God wants me to put into practice? What is the one thing God wants me to put into practice? And I have to thank Todd Stevenson for teaching me that from public church. So thank you, Todd. But when we look at this, this is the incentive. It's a perfect law. It's a law that that gives liberty. And here's the incentive. When you do the word, according to verse 25, you are blessed in your doing. Now the word we translate blessed can be translated fortunate. It can be translated happy. But I think that what he's getting at here is when you put into practice God's word, you are going to be looked upon with uh, um, a, a pleasing eye from God. You're going to be blessed in your doing. And I, I even happen to think that there's a, there's a bit of effectiveness in our work when we do it according to the Bible. Like when we try to live our lives outside of the parameters of God's word, woe to you if you are successful and disobedient at the same time. That's a terrible place to be. But also, but I think that there's a, there's a certain effectiveness in what God values when we do his word the way he says to do it. Now you might think, okay, well, what about all those missionaries and they only had one convert in their whole entire life? That was, effect, that was effectiveness in the eyes of God, okay? When you put into practice God's word in your marriage, in your home, in your workplace, in your personal life, in your thought life, in your imaginations. When you put that into practice, God says you're going to be blessed in your doing. That's the incentive that he gives us. So he's moving us from hostility, you know, take off the boxing gloves to humility, right? Receive with implanted, receive the word implanted. So next time somebody confronts you, I want you to think, am I being hostile or am I being humble? And then also think about the way you're receiving God's word. Am I being apathetic? Is it just kind of going in? Or am I actually putting it into practice? So we need to move from apathy to activity. Okay, so this next one, this next um, attitude is probably the most dangerous of all the attitudes and actually every attitude in scripture. It's the most dangerous of all attitudes. And we really need to be careful of this because it it takes God and it kind of uses God. It manipulates God for our own intended purposes. And so let's, let's discover what this is together in verse 26. Let's read it. If anyone thinks, can you say the word thinks? Thinks. If anyone thinks he is religious, just stop right there. If anyone thinks he's religious, if your self-estimation is I'm a religious person, I'm a good old boy, I'm a religious person. Why would people think that way? You know, maybe they have this certain checklist in their mind about ways to obey God. Well, I did this, I did that, I did that, I did that. Usually when you have a checklist, you compare your checklist with other people's checklists and you see that you're doing better than they are. So that's maybe one a litmus test to find out if you're actually think you're religious if, if, you, if we're constantly casting judgment on others. Matter, matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, it says when we live that way, we will devour each other. When we stop depending on the grace of God, we will devour each other each other. So if anyone thinks is religious, okay, maybe, maybe I think I'm religious because I get really excited on Sunday and I get more excited than anybody. I love doing this. I love stomping. Oh, was that too loud? That mess you up, Jonah, with the video? Okay. All right. Don't, don't edit that out. I want that in there. <laughs> so anyway, if, if, uh, um, if anyone thinks he's religious, you know, we can go through the motions. Jesus said it this way in, in Matthew 15. He said, these people come near to me with their lips 
but their hearts are far from me. If anyone thinks he's religious, this this third attitude is spiritual arrogance. It has nothing to do with the authentic expression of our Christian faith. It has nothing to do with the outworking of our relationship with Jesus. Matter of fact, the closer that you get to Jesus, the more humble you ought to be and the less arrogant we ought to be because we're realizing that more and more the, the, the darkness of our heart that Jesus shines his light into to save us from our sin. We need him, need him. The day you put your trust in Christ was just the first day of a lifelong journey of trusting in Jesus, that you need Jesus just as much today as you did the first day you put your faith in him. And he's saying this, listen, if you think you're religious, but you can't get your life under control, you're deceiving yourself. There's that word again, deceiving. And your religion is useless. It's worthless. The way you're serving Christ is useless. Now he says this, if you can't control your tongue, we learn from chapter three, we're gonna get there, that the tongue is a window to the heart. Jesus said that, but the tongue also is is representative of our our life. He's saying, listen, if if you think you're religious, okay, take off the boxing gloves with me because we all need this. I need this too. I'm staring right in the mirror. I can't be apathetic about it and I can't walk away and forget what he's saying. If I think I'm religious, if I think I am trying to truly express my Christian faith, but I can't keep my tongue under control, then my religion is worthless. I gotta put that down and I gotta come back to Jesus and find out what he really says about following him. Folks, these attitudes, these attitudes are are going to cripple your authentic expression of your Christian faith. They're gonna cripple your witness in front of others. They're gonna cripple your intimacy and your growth with Christ. They're gonna cripple your purpose, living out your purpose. Are you hostile toward the word of God? God says, be humble and receive his word. Get rid of the things in your life that you know are wrong and put in his word. They say, are we apathetic? Move from apathy to activity. Put into practice the things that he tells us to do and move from spiritual arrogance. Move from spiritual arrogance to service to service, spiritual service. And that's where we're going right here at the end of this, the end of this chapter. Now, before I go there, I want you to know that all of us in some way have stumbled. All of us have had one of those attitudes. I want you to think maybe where you're at right now. Which attitude do you have? Do you have hostility toward people that are correcting you? Do you have apathy? Eh, whatever, you know. Do you have spiritual arrogance? Well, look at me and not them. Which attitude do you have? Because we've all had one and maybe a combination of those that are keeping us from our authentic expression of our Christian faith. Now, you might know Jeff um, Julemus. He represented uh, the Haitian uh, Haitian country, Haiti, in uh, 2016 in the Olympics in Rio. And when he was doing his 100-meter dash toward, toward the end, you know, the semifinals, he hit the first hurdle and went down. He hit the first hurdle, stubbled, hit the second hurdle. He sat there for a second. He went underneath one hurdle. He got back up and he finished the race. So some of you, like me, have had some of these relationship hurdles that you've stumbled over. But don't sit there. Finish the race. That's where the grace of God comes in. That's where the grace of Jesus comes in, that his death on the cross, that his resurrection provide forgiveness for our sin and hope for our future, and a transformed heart. Folks, we've got to be rooted in the good news, the saving message of Jesus, because we stumble at one of those hurdles. And James is going to tell us right now, what is the authentic expression of your Christian faith? What is it? It says in verse 27 right here, religion that is pure and undefiled, that's the positive and negative way of saying the same thing, Pure and undefiled before God. And if you skip on down, it says that the religion that's acceptable to him, that's acceptable to him. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God is this, before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's unpack that just a little bit because we are dealing right now with a a corona crisis around the world that's isolating us. People are in great need, right? We just had tornadoes rip through East Tennessee, Hamilton County, Bradley County. We have a lot of trees down, a lot of people hurting. 
And not just that, there's people hurting in general. We know that we live in a broken society, in a broken world, a sin-ridden world where we have the need. People are lost in need of the gospel. People are in need of help. And what James is saying, these, this category of people, I don't think that he just means widows and orphans. I think he's giving us the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, a category of people that are desperately in need, that are desperately in need of our assistance. People that are gonna cause you to sacrifice, all right? People that are gonna cause you to give of your money, people that are gonna cause you to give of yourself and emotional energy. Sometimes it is draining. Being a parent is draining, you know? Um, But it's a great joy. And the same thing here is when we follow Christ and we parent the orphan and we visit the widow, we find great delight and great joy in knowing that this is the authentic expression of our Christian faith. Like we said at the beginning, Paul said in in Galatians that our faith is faith serving through love. Through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. And we do it in his name. And we might consider, okay, this is hard. It's not easy to do. But we can't be apathetic. If we're apathetic, we're not serving people. Did you know the opposite of love is not hatred? The opposite of love is apathy. Are we going to love people and serve them well? Are we going to love the needy, the, 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 the widow and the orphan in their affliction? And by the way, the word visit, notice here it says in verse 27, visit the orphans and the widows. And that word visit that we translate here means can also mean to care for. Basically, it's not just going and saying hello or picking up the phone and calling, even though it includes that. But to visit means to take, to take inventory of what their needs are, all kinds of needs, social needs, physical needs, financial needs. Take inventory of what their needs are and meet them. That's what we're called to do as a church. Folks, Greenhouse, this is our two-year birthday. You know that we are birthed to serve and that is the authentic expression of our Christian faith. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Like when we were weak and helpless, as Romans 5 says, Jesus stepped in. When people have needs, these, the, on one side of the, of the uh, generational ladder, you've got orphans. On the other side of the generational ladder, you have widows, people who are in desperate need, who don't have the ability or the means to care for themselves in their affliction. God says, you step in, in the name of Jesus. There's a young person that needs mentoring. There's a lost person that needs the gospel. There's somebody around the world who's, who's hurting that needs the gospel of Jesus that, that, that you are equipped to share. There is someone living in their affliction that God's gonna put in your path. Now, I know this, we can't help everyone. We just can't do it. But I guarantee that we can help everyone that God leads us to. We can help someone. God can put somebody in your life in my life to help, to, to give of ourself. Is it gonna be inconvenient? Yes. Is it gonna require emotional energy? Yes. Is it gonna be a financial strain? You bet, it's gonna be. But God has called you, every one of you, every one of you to, to, to reach out to somebody that's in need. Don't just give money to somebody else to do it, even though that's good. And I'm sure Camp Livingstones, woohoo, we're here at Camp Livingstones. I'm sure they would love for you to write a donation check here at Camp Livingstones for, for, for them to keep doing what they're doing, which, I, by the way, I love this space. I went and met my wife here, by the way. Um, uh, we got married and had a reception here. Um, so uh, this, is a, a, a great, uh, this is a great space, and I'm sure that they would, they would love your, your gifts here. Um, but folks, what, what we also need to know is that God's Word tells us we're not just giving something so somebody else can do it. We do that with like Samaritan's Purse and Camp Living Stones and, and Compassion International. And I understand that, that, that progress, that, that, those programs, that's important. But God's saying he's putting someone in your life for you to touch, for you to reach out to. It's so important that we serve. Folks, we have got to get rid of the attitude hurdles. We've got to get rid of the hostility. We can't serve people in hostility. We do that sometimes, right? Like, well, he, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to show you how to do it. <laughs> we think we're serving people. Or, or apathy. We can't serve people in apathy. Eh, you know, they're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it for them, you know. Uh, we, can't, we can't serve people in spiritual arrogance. <laughs> well, look at me. I can do this way better than you, so let me do this on your behalf. We can't, that's not how we serve people, right? We have a world that's hurting. Corona chaos is here, Right? Tornadoes have ripped through. People are lost. People are lonely. Folks, we have to give of ourselves. We have 
to serve. That's what God's called us to do. We are birthed to serve. Greenhouse, God is calling you and me, all of us, to serve together and separately in the name of Jesus so that our community and our world benefits. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you so much that you sent your son to serve us in ways that we could never serve ourselves. You sent your son to rescue us from sin and darkness and a life apart from you. You even meet our needs of, of daily bread, of food and clothing and shelter and relationship. God, we need that. You've, you've met our needs. And Lord, you say now with your power and with your example, it's our turn. Lord, I pray that you would send us someone today that we could bless in your name. I pray that, God, you would help us remove the attitudes that keep us from knowing you more and enjoying you better. Lord, I pray that you would remove hostility, Lord, from our lives. The things that, that we are corrected on from you and your word, I pray that we would humbly accept the areas of our life that are apathetic. I pray, God, that you, you generate power and, and by your, the presence of your Holy Spirit in us to, to want to obey and to actually obey. And we also pray that, Lord, you humble us from our spiritual arrogance, that we would have spiritual service, that we would not live in arrogance. We'd be humble and we'd serve our community and our world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Church, thanks for uh, tuning in today. Uh, thanks, Camp Livingstones, for letting us to be here. You know how to reach us. If you need anything, please reach out. My email address is todd at thegreenhouseathens.com. You can comment right here in the Facebook post. I hope that you do, or, other, or the, maybe the, the YouTube post, wherever you're watching. Put a picture of your family. I want to see you. Um, uh, you know our on-call number, 423-381-0339. We have an on-call number if you need something. If you know of somebody else in need, we want to reach out. We want to serve our community in the name of Jesus, for the, for the, the glory of Jesus. So thanks, folks. Uh, I'll see you next week.